for those. Sorry, it was me. Uh, for, um, he wrote a poem called, for those who can still ride in an aeroplane for the very first time. Uh, and in that poem comes the, the immortal phrase, uh, slow down Quentin. Quentin in that poem is a seven-year-old boy. I've used a phrase uh, in, in different contexts, but actually uh, the person who says it each time is a person called Stevie. Um, Blazing Saddles, that refers to Mel Brooks film, 1974 film. Uh, meatloaf comes into it at some stage. Okay, so I'm going to read it and then um, I'm writing a whole series of short stories at the moment because I feel as a writer I should do novels, short stories and poetry and so I've written uh, a short story called Just for Kicks and um, I'm only going to read you a thousand words. Of, it's it's 5,000 words long but I'm going to read you the first thousand words. Then I'm going to read you another Stevie and Quentin poem. And there's a very, very short one at the end. And, and it won't take too long, Ken. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. So you're, you're going to get a lot of Stevie and Quentin tonight. Um, starting off with rage. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. An angry man rides his Harley up the Great North Road, doing the ton, shouting his rage, singing his song, his battle cry, too old to die young. He turns to the girl on the pillion. Hold on tight, we'll blast on through the night. The dawn sees him fighting sleep as the angel of the North disappears in the rear view mirror. Slow down, Quentin. I'm too young to die. A caravan by the side of the road the smell of frying bacon, the sound of sizzling sausages, truckers, bikers, hitchhikers, the greasy spoon chained to the counter. Tea in mugs, sweet and hot, egg, bacon, fried bread, mushrooms, beans. Go easy on the beans, Quentin. Blazing saddles, I'll eat what I want. Pulls a bottle from the saddlebag, tips whiskey into his tea. Away they go, riding down the country lanes. Stop right here, hiding the bike in a wood, unrolling the ground sheet and blanket, making love like wild beasts, the beasts of the field, the buffalo on the prairie, the elephants in the jungle, the panthers escape from their cages. Stop, this is no poem, this is a cry for freedom, a voice carried away on the wind, a sigh in the treetops, the desolate croak of the raven the harbinger of death and eternal night. Do you love me? I'll love you till the end of time. Are you praying for the end of time? No, I'll not go gentle into that good night. On the road again, coming at evening to a remote fishing village where old men remember past catches when times were good and the herring fleet numbered hundreds and wives spent all day and all night filleting and smoking the fish fish, symbolic, slinking around in the seaweedy sea, but out of water, slippery and stinking. You're a queer fish, old man. You belong to the sea. I'll set you free. I'll set you adrift. You'll go west. The sinking sun will be your companion. If there is another shore, we'll meet there. Push the boat out one last time, said the old man. He turned. The girl had vanished. So that's, that's the end of Rage. And it, um, I hope you got, well, you, I told you about all the different allusions to different poets. Now, what, a, what I'm, I'm thinking that, that uh, Quentin and Stevie uh, might be the subject of another mega novel, but um, just at the moment, they're just a twinkling in the eye. And, and this is the short story uh, that kicks it off in a way. And uh, I think it shows that, at least when I'm writing a short story, I think in a quietly different way. Okay, it's called Just for Kicks. And it, uh, Just for Kicks refers to that song uh, by Mark, that pop song from 1963. They met in Dingle's dance hall. The band was coming to the end of a session. 
Black Mountain people, they use is gunpowder just to sweeten their tea. George Melly finished the number and collapsed into an armchair placed on stage just for him. Quentin turned to the girl who was also propping up the long bar. Hi, Dolly, can I buy you a drink? The Dolly Parton, blonde wig, black leather jacket and Doc Martin scowled at him. My name is not Dolly. They stared at each other. Seconds ticked by. Neither of them smiled. Either were soulmates. Our star signs, our star signs are compatible. And she'll say yes. Or I'm wrong. And she'll say no, thought Quentin. But if you must, the girl continued, I'll have a tequila sunrise. Quentin signaled to the barman, two tequila sunrises, please. What's your star sign, asked the girl. Tell me your name first, said Quentin. Stevie, Gemini. Two-faced, never trusted Gemini. Says who? Says my mother. Ah, oh, she didn't say one face looks to the past to inform the other that looks to the future. No, but she did say you, um, no, but she did say they could be fun. My dad was a Gemini. Where is he now? I don't know, he's long gone. They drank in silence for a while. Another band was playing. Fancy a blast on the old Harley? You're dressed for it. The leather trousers, you mean? Yeah, they certainly help if you go skidding along the road on your backside. They're not the real thing. I wouldn't trust them to save my skin. Where would you like to go? Where in the world, do you mean? No, we're limited to England. I'm all dressed up with nowhere to go. You choose. I have a cottage on the coast near Walkworth. Where's Walkworth? County Durham. That's miles away. Yep, about 300 miles. If we leave now, we'll be there by morning. What are you doing tomorrow? Nothing. I ain't doing nothing and I ain't got nothing. And nothing to lose? That's about it. They left the old warehouse. They passed George Melly's table. Night, Quentin, called George. Have a good one. Night, George. Quentin raised his hand in salute. They went round the corner to where the Harley Davidson was propped on its stand by the canal. The street lights left glittering reflections on the still water. Is Quentin really your name? Yes, Stevie, it really is. The Quentin, the sax player? The very same. He pushed the Harley upright and mounted, hop on. Stevie put a boot on the rear footrest and swung up onto the pillion. Her movements were smooth and easy, like she'd done this before. The engine was making a low rumble, barely ticking over as they inched out of the yard and onto Chalk Farm Road, heading for Golders Green and the beginning of the Great North Road. Hold on tight, we'll blast on through the night. His shout was carried away by the wind and drowned by the roar of the engine. He kept the speed down until they were out in the countryside, then he wound her up. They were doing the ton. Just for kicks, he yelled. Stevie let go the steel bar behind her seat and put her arms around his waist and hung on. He was singing, but she couldn't make out the words or the tune. If she'd cared to look, she'd have seen the faded red letters on the back of his leather jacket, which spelled out the words, too old to die young. Slow down, Quentin, she shouted. If we don't stop for a rest, you'll crash, and I'm too young to die. They pulled into a lay-by where a caravan that had once been white was serving breakfast out of a long, narrow hatch. Truckers, bikers, hitchhikers were gathered round, eating plate in one hand, fork in the other. Quentin ordered for both of them. Eggs, sausages, fried bread, beans, please. Stevie corrected him. I'll have tomatoes and no beans, please. She smiled at the woman behind the counter. They drank hot, sweet tea out of chipped white mugs. There was just one teaspoon chained to the counter. Go easy on the beans, Quentin. Blazing saddles, I'll eat what I want. He got a flask out of the saddlebag and poured a tot of whiskey into his tea. They went roaring down country lanes and came at last to a fishing village. Quentin's cottage was up a narrow cobbled alley. Steve showered and Quentin cooked up an omelette. They piled into the double bed that filled the entire space of the only bedroom. Quentin fell asleep immediately. It was evening when he was woken by Stevie caressing his nipple. She swung a leg over him and mounted. Her movements were smooth and easy, like she'd done this before. Okay. They walked down to the wharf. The cold, salty wind stung their faces. 
The anchor pub had small windows more to keep the elements at bay than to, in, than to take in the sweeping views of the North Sea. The local fishermen seemed to know Quentin. They regaled the newcomer with tales of times gone by, good times, when the herring fleet had numbered 100 boats and there were plenty of fish to go round. The wives had spent days and nights filleting and smoking the catch. Quentin left the cottage at dawn. He didn't wake Stevie. For the next two days, he was out in his old wooden sail-driven fishing smack. When he got back, Stevie was gone. She'd left a note on the kitchen table. You're a queer fish, old man. You belong to the sea. I'll set you free. I'll set you adrift. You'll go west. The sinking sun will be your companion. If there is another shore, we'll meet there. That's the end of the story. It's quite, it was quite different, I thought, but you know, it was the same really. Okay, so, so this is uh, still Quentin and still Stevie. Um, they're getting to know each other better now. And Quentin's telling Stevie about an evening at Petworth House which it would be just as well if I didn't read it to Barry Smith, actually. Anyway, there we go. Petworth House, a dialogue. I was sitting by the window in Petworth House. The world expert on Blake was in fine voice, but my mind was elsewhere, watching the sun go down over the lake as a fellow deer wandered home, seen only in silhouette. Then he mentioned Romney and Elizabeth Eilif in the same sentence, Elizabeth. A girl of humble birth who was seduced or seduced by a lord and became Countess of Egremont. Romney, I remembered, was much smitten by Emma Hart, also known as Amy Lyon, another girl of humble origin who repeatedly seduced or was seduced by one Regency dandy after another until she became Lady Hamilton, confidante to the kings of the two kingdom, the king of the two kingdoms. Romney was certain that Emma was the most beautiful woman in the world, but what he loved about her was her wit. Wit and beauty, with two strings to her bow, a girl could go a long way in Georgian London. Stevie. Stevie says, slow down, Quentin. One or two tarts make it to the pinnacle of society. So what? It was a time of obscene inequality. As a pregnant 16 year old, Emma had an even's chance of dying before her 25th birthday. She was sold, Quentin, sold. First by Featherstone Howe to Greville, then by Greville to Lord Hamilton, to add to his collection of beautiful objects. And remember this too, Quentin, Emma died, neglected and penniless in Calais at the age of 49. Okay, Ken, this yeah. is the last poem. And uh, if you un unmute everybody, they can yell out, slow down Quentin at the right moment when I go. <laughs> okay, so you want everybody to yell, slow down Quentin when you wave at us. That's right. It'll be obvious. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? It's uh, the poem's called Pigeons. I'm not sure I can unmute. Can I unmute everybody? It just says mute everybody. I don't think right, I can. Un so we have to. We have to manually unmute ourselves. Has to unmute themselves. <laughs> so, Piers, can you just tell us what the cue line is? When he waves. And I shout out, Stevie. Okay. It's not Stevie says, just Stevie. No, no, just Stevie, and then I go like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It may work. It may not. We'll try. <laughs> anyway, it's called Pigeons and it's very short. So don't go to sleep, okay? <laughs> you won't have time to doze, doze off this time. It's called Pigeons and it starts with Quentin. I hate pigeons, trampling the flowers, emptying the bird feeder, shitting on the car. Shoot them all. Stevie, slow down, down, down Quentin. <laughs> You are less than one chromosome away from being a pigeon yourself. Live and let live. <laughs> and that's, the that's the end. Thank you very much. Piers, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Very entertaining, of course, as, uh, as always. Thank you. And uh, 
In the meantime, welcome, Tina. Sorry, I'm so late. Um, I didn't get back till really late. The traffic was just absolutely awful tonight. Right. It's okay. So, You're here. Um, yeah, we're great. We're grateful. It's lovely. Not acceptable, sorry, I mean, Tina. I've put a mark against your name. I'm sorry. It's just not acceptable. Okay. <laughs> yes, sure. Mike's a bit stricter um, than me. Um, sorry, okay. Sorry, sorry, so sorry. let's so let's start up with the open mic. Um, those of you who know um, will know that I'll call you in any particular order. Um, the rules are um, one poem, no epics. Um, but tonight, I mean, if, if people have more than one poem, maybe we'll get a chance to read more than one. I think that would be nice if, uh, if there's time. We'll see how that goes. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a poem, of course. I don't mean to be prejudicial, so you can read whatever you would like. Um, now, I know Mike and Leah and Jake have got to go um, within the half an hour, so you'll get on earlier than everybody else. Um, Holly, I also meant to say, by the way, if you want to be on our mailing list, um, where just I'll just remind you of, of, uh, of events that are, up, are coming up, um, there is a place on the website where you can um, sign up to be on the mailing list. Mike, is that on every page or just on... Um, I don't think it's on on literally every page of the website, but it's on the um, home page at the very bottom. Right. Um, and it's also on the bottom, I think, of the about page and probably at the bottom of, of oh, it's not at the bottom of the about page, but it's at the bottom of the home page and probably the bottom of the events page. OK, yes, so if you're not on the email list and you'd like to be, then you you're able to sign up there. And that means you'll you'll get notification of what's upcoming. OK, so. Welcome to the open mic part of the evening and thanks once again to Piers. Piers, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to kick off, I think, Elaine, I'd like to kick off with you. Hey, but um, did, did uh, some of those who have to go earlier want to read first? They'll follow you, Elaine. Okay, all right, <laughs> thank you. Um, my poem is called Cool Park, October 2018. It was uh, my first trip to Ireland. Far down the turlow, swans swam in the reeds, legions of twilight. I had not brought opera glasses for this adagio. But here I was in October, 19 summers long gone on Lady Gregory's grand estate. The sky was hardly still slate clouds listing for shelter, as stately as the spirits gliding over water. To commemorate place, our guide read aloud Yeats's swan poems, his words lost on the cold current of wind. Yeats loved swans, but had he seen them in creepy habits floating at evensong on Dublin's Grand Canal like a flotilla of dreaming nuns, he might have considered nature better than glory, but no chance. His initials mark the old autograph tree in Lady Gregory's garden, along with other Irish writers. This copper beech fenced in to keep out naughty boys who would carve their own names into its bark. The names of the great, almost illegible in, the, in its expanding trunk, melting in the oven of time. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, so yes, Leah, you do have to leave early. So would you like to read next? Okay. Yeah. I unmuted, yes. Um I don't know what to say about this. It's called it's called Do You Take Your Lover? Do you take your lover as your lawful wedded husband? Do you take your mistress as your lawful wedded wife? Do you realize when these words are spoken, it will change your life? You'll spend less time in the bedroom as the kitchen takes its place, planning meals and cleaning house than putting makeup on your face. Jewels and compliments out the window while his friends stream through the door. He's now hooked on TV while you're picking beer cans off the floor. Restaurants, he prefers home cooking 
while you both used to eat out. Suddenly he hates noise, strange foods, and prices. Just to mention them, mention them makes him pout. He was never cheap. In fact, so willing to spend as if cash grew on trees. And now suddenly he's into saving. While you plead to go out, please? What happened to all that splendor before you took the vow? Want to know where his head and his heart's gone? Ask the mistress he's got now. That's it. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Um, okay, so next up, please. I'm just looking at you all on my screen. Next up, please, Christine, would you like to read? Unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. There you are. Um, we had a poetry evening at a Harborside Inn at Bosom quite recently. And Bosom is a little way down the coast from Chichester. Ken asked us to write about the sea. And here is what I read at the Anchor Blur. What do I think of when I think of the sea? When I think of the sea, I think of oceans, of the shining salt sea surface, of selkies and sirens luring and beckoning, of mermaids and mermen, with their mesmerizing beauty. I think of sailors and smugglers and pirates with gold doubloons and barrels of brandy. I think of Captain Pugwash and his ship, the Black Pig. I think of vessels adrift and the mystery of the Marie Celeste, of yachts at anchor in foreign ports. I think of wharves and jetties and lonely sandbanks of tides swelling in a relentless pattern, moon pulled, time driven. I think of white crested waves, a froth of lace on a gravelly shore. I think of lights twinkling along an indigo coastline and the sky with stars above the sea. Ah, the sea, mysterious, unknowable, exciting, possibly treacherous, or smooth and tranquil. That's what I think of when I think of the sea. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was a great reading um, by, the, by the sea, from the sea. Um, so that was, that was lovely, that was a great reading. If you'd enjoyed that, um, please, take note that our reader, our featured reader for November will be none other than Christine Rowlands. So um, Christine will be gathering her work now and getting ready and preparing for <laughs> November's reading. Um, so that's exciting for, the, for you to be up next. Thank you. Um, okay, um, next up, please, let's go with, um, Bonnie, let's go with you. Hello, am I on? Yes. yes okay. Um, this poem, you know, you never know where a poem is going to come from. And uh, this poem started with a very sort of ordinary type of thing. And look what it led to. It's called writing paper. As I load another stack of paper into my all-in-one home office printer, the silky texture of the sheets between my fingertips gives me a small thrill of pleasure, and I am grateful for its abundance in this country. It is tempered, though, by the thought of how many trees were taken down to create this amazing product, even though I place every bit of it that I discard, including the old newspapers and avalanche of junk mail that hits our mailbox daily into our recycling bin. I realize how important a part of my life writing paper is, how until our recent digital age, it has been the precious conveyor of our thoughts, our stories, our words. From the time I was a little girl writing in a leather bound diary with tiny lock and key my mother gave me to all of my school assignments from first grade through college, graduate and law schools, my poems and soon to be published first book it has been my constant companion. How much I always love the printed words and pictures on it, from the thousands of books I've read 
since I learned to read. I still remember how exciting it was to receive my first library card in the children's section of our hometown library when I showed the librarian I could write my first and last name after much nervous practice at home with my mother. I even enjoyed the musty smell of the decaying pages and covers of the old books on its shelves. Even before I could read, I recall my mother reading aloud those magical words on paper to my younger sister and me every night before we went to bed, including chapter by chapter, Little Women and the Five Little Peppers that we wanted to never end. One of us snuggled on each side of her on the old couch in the tiny living room in the downstairs apartment of the first house my parents bought, bought after my father came home from the war. So many types of paper abound in my house that I use for different purposes. In addition to the reams of white to print out words for my computer, there are the long blue lined yellow pads. I still write my first drafts of everything on the yellow squares of sticky posted pads for reminders that I paste on my desk, walls, railings, doorposts, and kitchen counter, my blue spiral notebook that serves as my journal, my week at a glance, old school calendar, always open on my desk for noting appointments and errands, despite the use by most people I know of digital calendars and schedules on their computers and phones. Not me, not yet. I am still in love with paper, an affair that hasn't vanished or grown old. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bonnie. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so next up, please, um, Jake, are you ready? I have to give up my seat, you realize. <laughs> This is called Great Idea for a Poem, and I've lost it. Um, come here. Okay. It's gone. You didn't hear that, I hope. <laughs> I, I think everybody's had this experience, but still, maybe it's uh, not banal. I lay there restless in my bed. It was dark, the middle of the night. My mind wandered, had a great idea for an important poem I'd write. It was topical, quirky, humorous, full of rich language, a tour de force, metaphors and similes too, including popular themes, of course. It would receive acclaim from all, even critics would greet its birth. All who heard it would agree it was serious, yet brought instant mirth. In the night, I had my finest thoughts, creative, cohesive, practical, on every subject under the sun, writing, house, garden, personal. There's more to come. Morning, I come awake, climb slowly out of the pit of sleep, face the light and all it brings into the day's action gradually creep. Once breakfast and chores are over, sit at my PC and start to work, answer emails, update website. There's nothing I must ever shirk. And then, and then I have a thought. What did I think in the depth of night? There was that great idea. The poem I really have to write. How did it go? What did it say? Was it about Trump, Brexit, or cats? There are phrases at the edge of my mind. What was it? I'm going bad. Good listener, you've already guessed. My nighttime thoughts have gone, vanished in sleep and daytime cares. All is erased, all is undone. So if I want to write my poem, I'll have a pen and pad close at hand. I'll sleep, wake, 
think and write it down. Come the morning, I'll see it's not grand. That's it. Man. Thank you, Jake. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, Dennis. Hello. Um, good to see you. Okay, next up, please. I think we'll go with uh, Tina. Could you unmute yourself, please? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it was after Jen's uh, reading the other week. Bonnie said, some, said um, I think it was Bonnie who said, isn't heartache beautiful? And I thought that was a really beautiful line. And I wrote this poem straight away. So I nicked your words, Bonnie. <laughs> it's called, Isn't Heartache Beautiful? Isn't heartache beautiful, she said with a sad smile. And we all laughed, yet acknowledged the pain of the edge of an ache, giving way to the pang of longing. I always thought life became more beautiful with love, bigger, more vivid, louder somehow. Sunsets became messages of promise. Tomorrow will be better, easier. Raindrops become precious diamonds. Drips chime with every passing minute as killing time becomes the necessity. The sound of leaves rustling through autumn sunshine made us smile that last afternoon. We should have partied then instead of lingering and limping on weakly, blindly towards the inevitable. For heartache can be more beautiful, I guess, than the slow rupture of love. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next up, I'd like to invite uh, Mike. Mike, how about you? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm torn between reading one that is a bit blue or reading one that's a bit um, not blue. Um, so I'm actually going to read um, two short ones that are related and that are um, not so blue. Um, so the first one, it hasn't got a title. Um, I just found it. I wrote it about four years ago. <clears throat> the bed is made, dishes cleaned, bits of paper moved from one spot to another, and still the vacuum cleaner sits there in the cold, empty hallway, rejected, longing to sing its song, yearning to whir its motor, shunned again. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and so, the rejected Hoover finally sang its song, roaring across the carpet like an Austin Martin, tearing along a twisted alpine track, its growling motors set free in the unassuming front living room that just for a night thrums with the bass of a long-awaited howl. <laughs> That's one, mate. I may have to dash off relatively soon, but um, I'll try and listen to as many as possible. And thank you to everyone who's read so far. And thank you, Piers, um, for your readings. Thank you very much. If anyone wants to read Piers' latest blog post, it's on the, it's on the Words Out Loud uh, website. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. Um, okay, next up, <clears throat> let's invite Sue to unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to um, read um, an extract from a short story. Um, anyway. You'll get the idea, I think. Three is my lucky number. She gestured for the refill, which was quick to materialize. It may have been her lucky number, but it wasn't Richard's. Third floor, three steps from the safety of their holiday home from home. Just three steps to much of the same. Just before that moment, he had been shouting to make his point, as if the level of his of his voice and the constant repetition could somehow make her understand and comply 
with his way of thinking. It's total rubbish. He was in full on, full of himself mode, total cycle babble. You're so gullible sometimes, he continued. And then as if realizing his mistake added, that's why I love you. It wasn't worth another argument. And they had briefly kissed his mouth absent-mindedly grazing her cheek. And there he stood preening and self-satisfied just ahead of her on the stairs when he caught his shoe on the pebble dash and stumbled, the pride, the fall, the briefest moment in time that on looking back stretches on and on to breaking point. His wry half smile of satisfaction frozen for a split second, precarious, before his whole body reached out, grasping for the non-existent railing to steady himself, backward. 20 foot or more, she watched him tumble to earth over and over again, thud, repeating, replaying, remembering the endless talk where, when everything changed, thud. She blinked and blinked again, unnerved. It's shocking and strangely thrilling the way that life can change in an instant without warning, without a hint of disaster in the air, and yet it can, and it does. But there was warning, wasn't there? Total psychobabble? No, she didn't, couldn't think so. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, next up, please, uh, can I invite Nigel? Nigel, you come and unmute yourself, please. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I have a poem that I wrote a while back. It's called Dawning. A mountain range rises out of the distant haze. Such a view as this never fails to amaze. The rising of the clouds, those pinnacles released from the shrouds, creating such wonderful displays. The shafts of sunlight and the green of the trees, ochres, greens and gray reflected onto the rocks. Flocks of swirling gliding birds soar above the trees. When the sun's at its zenith, the view is ablaze. Oh my, I could watch a splendor for days and days until the sunlight dips the last of its golden rays and we then await a fresh new dawn. That's it. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. That was lovely. Um, okay. Let's next. Um, Holly, you've been very patient. Would you like to read? Uh, unmute yourself and let's go. Um, a little bit long. Sorry, I'll do a shorter one next time. I didn't know. Okay. Um, I work as an archaeologist, and um, one of the places I work at is a Bronze Age site in Crete. And um, so this poem is um, about that site. And it's called Waiting in Silence. The scattered sherds upon the ground told us here is where they lived, but we couldn't see or speak to them to ask them what they did. And so we marked a grid out, each a five meter square. And at dawn next day, we began to dig and hoped they'd meet us there. We dug and dug and scraped and troweled and bagged the things we found. And if they stood by watching, they never made a sound. Yet I felt them in the shadows beneath the shaded olive trees. And in the heat of the summer's day, I whispered to them, please, I want to get to know you, to hear what you just said. But all I heard was silence, for they were long ago dead. And I wondered, had they answered, what language would they speak? Linear A, linear B, the beginnings of ancient Greek. We dug and dug for six long weeks and slowly brought to light the evidence of how they lived and of what became their plight. Walls of stone a metre tall, capped with mud bricks baked. The first few treads of staircases, worn down door sills, scraped. Corridors and rooms square, impressions of wooden beams, floors of plaster, floors of stone, homes for life 
and dreams. Outside yards for sitting in to pass the time of day, narrow streets and crossroads, alleyways for play. And within these ruined structures, hidden by soil and clay, the lost and abandoned fragments of their ancient lives lay. And it was these things that spoke to me, that told me who lived here, and with every find their voices grew, and now this is what I hear. I hear children laughing as they run down to the sea, and fishermen calling and singing as they bring their catch in for tea. I hear goats bleating up on the hillside bare, and dogs barking and growling at strangers passing there. I hear the tread of oxen as they furrow the sun-baked soil, and the rumbling crush of a millstone as it squeezes the olive oil. I hear women chatting as they sit outside and spin, and the clack, clack, clack of the loom when they sit at night within. I hear the splash of a water jug as it drops into the well, and the call of a passing merchant bringing their wares to sell. I hear men shout greetings as they pass in the narrow street, and the whir of a potter's wheel, and the hiss of a furnace heat. And then came a sound, piercing and chill. I hear fear and confusion at an ancient God's will, and I open a bag to see what's inside, and now I know how and why they died. Ash, fine ash, volcanic and grey, fallen from skies that darkened the day, carried on a wave that sucked back the sand, only to return it and bury the land. Nature turned wild, but who was to blame? They called to the gods, but no answer came. Those that survived reluctantly fled, taking only their memories of the left-behind dead. And slowly the sky filled once more with light. The day stood alone, separate from night. And the place that was once full of life, full of sound, lay waiting in silence, deep underground. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. It wasn't that long at all. Oh, it was a bit long. <laughs> That's all right. It's fine. That's fine. Well, that's not what we call an epic, but um, an epic would go on quite a bit longer than that, okay. and, would cut, and would be cut off. <laughs> um, Dennis, welcome. Please read. Thank you. This is called a woman's poem. Author unknown. He didn't like the casserole and he didn't like my cake. He didn't like my biscuits, excuse me. His, he said my biscuits were too hard, not like his mother used to make. I didn't make the coffee right. He didn't like my stew. I didn't fold his pants the way his mother used to do. I pondered for an answer. I was looking for a clue. Then I turned around and smacked the shit out of him like his mother used to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I don't know where you find them, but they're wonderful. <laughs> uh, next up, please, I'd like to invite Helen. Hello. Um... So I'm actually going to be reading a poem written by my grandmother. Um, about 10 years ago, she um, decided to just drop a book of poetry and didn't tell any of us. Um, so she is currently 92 and living happily alone, um, which is part of the reason that I am in this country to begin with, um, to get to know her more. Um, and last year over lockdown, while I was still in the States, I um, interviewed her. Uh, I spent two days getting a series of, a of hour to two hour interviews and trying to kind of understand her life. And I think when I finally read some of her poetry, it gave me a lot of inspiration and just 
insight into her life. So this is one of her poems from her book, um, Sumerian Garden. <clears throat> Turn away, for this is a wasteland, and you will find no buried treasure here, only whitening strips of heart and the broken bits of memories, the sharp ends. And you will find no buckets of tears, only dried sniffles on faded photographs drifting on the wind. And if you look closely, you will find the awkward parts that refuse to fit into plans. And here and there, the corroded cogs of good intentions scattered on the tarmac. And if you listen, you can hear the clack of a twisted signpost as it whacks its head against the wall. So go away, but stay if you can fix things. Mm. That's all. Wow, that was lovely. And is that the only book that you have of hers? She only wrote the one? She only wrote one book, um, but that's, you know, one of many poems in it. Right, oh, that's yeah. lovely. That's yeah. really nice, what a good story. Yeah, um, she started writing poems when she was about, well, sometime in the mid 50s when she was in the sanatorium and then had five more children. And then her husband died 20 years ago. And so she began writing poetry again. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. OK, so we've all been round once. So I don't know if people have another one that they'd like to read. Um, because you know, we're, it's only the night. The, the night in England is young. The morning is early in California. So, Leah, you're on. Oh, one the two. They're not wrong. Either one of them. Okay, I'll do one of um, thee, and, thee and Me. Okay. Have I, have I done any that don't rhyme? Okay, to, I'll, um, okay, this is Thee and Me. You'll never guess who it is. Like Jack Spratt, we too, sorry. Like Jack Spratt, we, two magnets repelling, opposing each other while somehow still gelling. You are all knowledge while I am emotion. You know most everything. I feel commotion. Opposites clinging with a strong devotion. Your life is all scattered. Sorry, your life is all sorted while mine is a scatter. You believe in the news. To me, people matter. So you always see cock up while I see conspiracy. I want things to change. You, were you up to let them be? Your scene is compliant and me, I am trouble. I always go toward it, you skip on the double. Though our ways are so different, we're both still a team, traveling separate directions while in the same stream. Thee, thee and me, the mystical we, but then without yin, we're aware would yang be. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, does anybody else have any another one that they'd like to read, please? Okay, Christine, I saw your hand first. So, you're on. Thank you. This um, follows on from the Bosom poem. Um, to understand what this poem, it helps to be familiar with the stories of John Ryan, their children's stories. We'll do it after this one. In Bosom recently, I thought about Captain Pugwash and his ship, the Black Pig, about brandy smuggling and mischievous mermaids. But modern smugglers don't just deal in wine and spirits. There are people smugglers, dealers in misery, and those who make fortunes by shifting cocaine and armaments. There are slave owners and transporters of children for the gratification of those who can and will pay. There are industrialists dumping toxic waste around the world. But I think there are good people like Captain Pugwash and his cabin boy Tom, 
who overpower black-hearted Jake and his ilk and win the day. It can be done. I believe good will prevail. I live in hope. And that's it. Thank you, Christine. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So who else? Wave at me. Okay, um, Tina, I saw you. We're going. Yeah, we better go. We better go. Tina, you're on. Please unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so this is a. Um, I got bitten by a spider last week, which wasn't very pleasant. Um, and as I do with most kinds of trauma, I wrote a poem about it. And it's called, That's the Last Time I'm Kind to a Spider. <laughs> it's, I wrote it very quickly, so it's nothing fantastic, but it's fun. Um, turned on tap to fill a kettle to make early morning tea, noticed something long-legged and trying to flee. Fetched a glass and gently helped him out of the sink. Took a, took a couple of attempts, then he was out in a blink. Little fella then appeared, nestled in window frame, then ran back inside. Was this some sort of game? Half asleep, I left him alone with a yawn. Ate breakfast as the sun came up over the lawn. Washed up wearing marigolds, suddenly felt a small prick. Gloves off, guess who'd been inside and gave me a nip. He's now on the floor, sulking by the sink. If he wants any help, well, He's going to have to rethink. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I, took, I took it really personally. <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> and who wouldn't? <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Um, who else would like to read again? Okay, Sue, I see you. Okay, unmute yourself, Sue. Oh, hello, hello again. Yes. Um, Going on from Christine's at the Anchor Blur, um, it, it's wonderful to have a theme to write to because I didn't have anything about the sea and uh, it really inspired me. So in the end, it inspired me. So I'm going to read one um, called The Sea that I read on um, last, whenever it was. <laughs> last week, wasn't it? So it's called The Sea. It's called Sea, in fact. Splosh, splash. Lap and crash, alien life, breeze, in, out, bobbing about, seagulls, crabs, no trees. Scuttle and skit, sparkled sunlit. Ozone, incredible power. Dark night, moonlight, inky black undulating with glower. Spray mist. Salt kissed, hidden depths at play, Fish team, glint and gleam, a magical, fun away day. Riptide, seaside, incredible colours, free. Soft sand, no land. Wet, undescribable, wet, undeniable, wet, uncompromisable sea. <laughs> Thank you. Nice one, Sue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, who else? Uh, Nigel, I see you waving. You're on. I've got a, just a very short one. It's called A Little Nonsense, and it also relates to our readings down at the bosom last week, but it wasn't one I actually read. The C that you see begins with an S, not a C, and you had better believe me because if you look, you will see that it is so in the dictionary, you see. <laughs> in the great, that great tradition of nonsense rhymes. Nice one. <laughs> um, thank you, Nigel. Thank you. So anybody else? Who else? Uh, Holly, I see you're waving. You're on. I have got another little one, I think. It's called the, um, the Old Lady of Crete. Um, I passed her on the road, the Old Lady of Crete, dressed all in black, slight of body, thin stockinged legs,
thin arms, thin hands, sun-kissed brown and windswept. Her back slightly stooped, headscarf drawing to a thin point on her thin shoulders. She walked at the edge of the road, at the edge of life, and in her hands, held up in front of her face, she carried Horta, that wild, green, life-sustaining, fennel-fancying leaf, and time for both of us stood still. She seemed to me to be moving into the past, as I rushed by, a still life in black and green that stopped me when it caught my eye. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. Um, so we have Elaine, Helen, Bonnie, Dennis haven't read for a second time. So you guys up? Anybody up for that? Out of you? Four? No, Elaine? If Dennis? you don't mind more Shakespeare, I could do something. Well, of course you can. We love Shakespeare here. All right. So you have you have the you have the conch. Okay. Well, this is um, a speech from King John. It's the bastard. <clears throat> Mad world. Mad kings, mad composition. John, to stop Arthur's title in the whole, hath willingly departed with a part. And France, whose armor conscience buckled on, whom zeal and charity brought into the field as God's own soldier, rounded in the ear with that same purpose changer, that sly devil, that broker that still breaks the pate of faith, that, that daily break vow, he that wins of all, of kings, of beggars, old men, young men, maids, who having no external thing to lose but the word made, cheats the poor maid of that, that smooth-faced gentleman, tickling commodity. <laughs> Commodity, the bias of the world. The world who of itself is peased well, made to run even upon even ground till this advantage, this vile drawing bias, this sway of motion, this commodity makes it take head from all indifferency from all direction, purpose, course, intent. And this same bias, this commodity, this bod, this broker, this all changing word, clapped on the outward eye of fickle France, hath drawn him from his own determined aid, from a resolved and honorable war to a most base and vile concluded peace. And why <laughs> rail I on this commodity? But for because he hath not wooed me yet. Not that I have the power to clutch my hand when his fair angels would salute my palm. But for my hand, as unattempted yet, like a poor beggar raileth on the rich. <laughs> well, whiles I am a beggar, I will rail and say there is no sin but to be rich. And being rich, my virtue then shall be to say there is no vice but beggary. Since kings break faith upon commodity, Gain be my Lord, for I will worship thee. Rhyming couplet and done. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you so much. It was lovely. Um, Dennis, Bonnie, either of you got something? No? Dennis, no? No? Okay. My dears, we are done. Um, I, I can. <laughs> yes, sorry, you're waving. Yes, I don't have another poem, but I did want to ask 
Christine, is this Captain Pugwash a, a book, a children's book? <laughs> I love the name. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a comical book for children with a little fat uh, pirate called Captain Pugwash and his, his um, cabin boy who knows everything and does everything really, runs the ship and they fight the baddies, that's it, yes. Is that the name of the book, Captain oh, Pugwash? It's, it's a whole series of books. So, any, so anything with John Ryan, the author and person who draws it and Captain Pugwash in the title. Okay. I'm sorry, I haven't got one to show you. Okay, thank you. A long nice. time ago was a TV um, comic strip too. Oh, was it on the TV? Yeah. Um, you're not old enough. Because I believe he lived in Rye, the author, and Rye is a little smuggler's port, one right. of the sanctuaries. Yeah. 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 Or East yes. Sussex. It's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, apocryphal stories about, uh, about that. I just uh, wanted to add something. Um, whoops. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, to Holly, I so appreciated your poem that you read, the first one uh, about uh, being an archaeologist and having that experience. Um, and I just wonderful. Um, my husband is really into archaeology, but you know, not not that much. But uh, we used to get uh, some of these archaeology magazines too, and uh, he was always fascinated by it. It's just wonderful to hear somebody read what the experience is like of actually uncovering this stuff. It's just great. You're right, you're right. Thank it was you. interesting. Yeah, thank you. Um, the other thing about the ash was it was um it was about the um eruption of um the island of Santorini, Thera mm -hmm. in the Bronze Age, and we actually found some of the um volcanic ash mm -hmm. from the fallout, which was exciting. Very exciting, very exciting. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, fascinating. Um, just to say, coming up, those of you who are based here in, in England, um, next week, the 27th, sees another open mic um, in person at New Park Road Centre. I'm not sure, Christine, do you know what time that starts? Or Holly, do you know what time? Is that 7 or 7.30? 7.30. Uh, I, I don't know. I was going to ask about that, if anybody knew. We think it's 7.30 at New Park Road Centre. So do go along to that. And the week after that, the 3rd um, of November, is our um, open mic in Wagtail Coffee and Yoga. So there's quite a lot of um, stuff going on at the moment. So it's wonderful to see you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Um, see you next month on Zoom and see you before then, I hope, for most of you. Take good Thank care. you, Ken. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Love you all. Very much. It's, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Good. Welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Can I ask what this is? Uh, it's it's um, applaud um, without making noise. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> it's how we applaud without making noise. And I think, it, is, it, is it ASL, American Sign Language? It's sign language, isn't it? For okay, applause? Yeah. I think it is. I think it's sign I language. I like that. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody, take good care. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ken. Bye. Thanks very much, Ken. Bye. Bye. Bye.